Good morning and welcome to day two of the Sustainability Week, uh, brought to you virtually by The Economist. Uh, today we're going to be discussing how to prepare for a sustainable future and, and what that means for business models. Uh, this is obviously a pressing issue. Um, it is one that companies are grappling with, uh, especially uh, fiercely now at a time of the pandemic. Uh, and this pandemic can be seen as both a potential hurdle, an obstacle to um, making businesses more sustainable because obviously it, uh, it brings other um, possibly more pressing short-term issues to the attention of boards and CEOs. But on the other hand, it might also be seen as an opportunity to reinvent businesses because they are already being forced to reinvent themselves in so many different ways. And this reinvention could be for a better, more sustainable uh, future. And to discuss this, um, we have uh, a distinguished panel of, uh, of interesting vantage points, uh, starting with Thomas Fekete, who is the Europe, Middle East and Africa Head of Strategy and Products for Sustainable Investing at BlackRock. We have Hoop Savalkus, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer of Philip Morris International. Aris Vretos, who is the director for the Center for Business Transformation at the Cambridge Institute of Sustainability Leadership. And Rachel McGinley, who is the head of sustainability at CBRE Ireland. Uh, Aris, maybe as, as the academic in the room, I, I will start with you. And I'll start with the question that uh, I posed in the introduction. Do you see the pandemic as more of an obstacle or more of an accelerant in broad terms uh, when it comes to reinventing companies to be more sustainable? Thank you and, and good morning, everyone. Um, I think the, the pandemic has uh, given rise and, and made everybody feel much more open to some of the issues that we have been discussing in sustainability for a while. So. Um, there are some of the undesirable effects, obviously, the health impacts, uh, even the unintended positive consequences, like the reduction in CO2 emissions from uh, loss of trading activity and consumption and, and, and business activity. But I think um, it has also and, and mainly created a sense of um, vulnerability, of a need to look at the system in a different way to see the path that we've been taking, how resilient that is for businesses, for the economy, for communities and for societies. And I think at the center of that, it has created a um, need to revisit the S uh, in the ESG, particularly as, as we think about social issues. And while inequality as an issue has been growing in significance over the last couple of years, with the rising gap between the rich and the poor around the world, within countries too, I think that the pandemic has made us really uh, take a step back and look at how resilient, how vulnerable, how strong are we? What 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 do we value in society? What is our purpose? Uh, and to put it sort of more more grandly, you know, there are there are uh, conversations everywhere about the role of communities, um, about the value of work and which jobs and which functions in society should be paid more or less. So all those questions that have been bubbling for, for a while, the pandemic has come and kind of made them, put them right front and center. And the other benefit um, from all this crisis has been that we have seen that we can intervene very radically. We, we uh, as governments have kind of come together or on their own, have made transformative changes to the economy to deal with what we perceive as public crisis and public issues. So this, this, this notion that it's unaffordable or uh, we have to, you know, there are various constraints that we, we like to put on not investing or not taking radical actions or not changing things, that all seems to have been demystified through the response that we have put in the pandemic. So with all this crisis and the loss of, of, of health, um, we, we are at least in a position to revisit some of the core foundations uh, of um, the economy, society and business. 
that, that, that's um, that's sort of the sense that I often got when speaking to uh, to some CEOs um, on Zoom, uh, which we we try to do uh, as often as possible. Hoop, I'd like to go to you now uh, and ask you, sort of, from your perspective as a as a as a large multinational business, do you get a sense that the S in ESG is now getting more attention than the than the E? Uh, it, it was it, there was clearly a sense, you know, even in Davos uh, earlier this year, the environment was really rising up to corporate agenda. Um, uh, it, sort of ESG almost became a byword. You know, it was it was basically the E that mattered to in, in ESG, um, and and now the S is becoming much more prominent. But on the other hand, there is a, possibly a trade-off um, when you are a company or a nation, for that matter, but specifically a company with limited resources, um, as all companies are. Uh, a dollar you spent on better wages or supporting the community is a dollar less spent on, you know, decarbonizing. Um, so, so there is a trade-off there. Do you see that trade-off being uh, more visible at PMI? And if so, uh, how how are you trying to approach it? Well, I think I mean all companies should um, start with a sort of a materiality analysis to see where can you as a company make the biggest impact and where do you cause the largest externalities. And uh, indeed, many people uh, equate sustainability with environmental matters predominantly. Um, but if you look at it, take our company. You know, we are a tobacco company. The biggest impact we have. Uh, is on the, the health of the consumer. So actually the ESG discussion uh, is actually missing the P of product, I think, sometimes. And uh, in my strong conviction, I think if you don't look at your most material topics and address them head on, I don't think you can call yourself sustainable as a company. So in our case, the focus has been very much on what can we do about the product that we produce and sell and the impact on the consumer. And the conclusion is very clear we must replace cigarettes with something better. And this is the, the line we have been on for the last four years. And we think that many countries can be without cigarettes within 10 to 15 years. So that's my, my short answer. If you look more broader at ESG, I think many companies, including ourselves, the between the E and the S, um, the S is far has far bigger impacts. I mean, in our case, it's predominantly uh, the, the farmers who are producing tobacco and labor issues, uh, especially in developing countries, which are, uh, I would say, the, the major focus we have uh, when it comes to sustainability. Not that we are ignoring climate change, but uh, uh, climate change is, of course, the number one material topic for the planet. Uh, and we are, I think, very good in that respect. But as a tobacco company, you can be the greenest company on the planet. If you don't do something about the product, I don't think you can call yourself sustainable. How, so can I just do a follow-up question on that? You mentioned materiality. How does PMI, do you have a, a sort of a specific algorithm for determining what in your uh, business is, you know, does have material externalities, positive or negative? Yep. Um, and, and so yep. how, do you, how do you analyze materiality? I think that might be very interesting for, 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 for other firms. Yeah, yeah. Look, we uh, first look at, you know, based, of course, we have a lot of... Um, stakeholders who provide us feedback continuously uh, from, let's say, tobacco control groups to more, uh, you know, Human Rights Watch, other, other organizations. So the first thing is to look at uh, what do people say and think about uh, the main impacts of the company. So we had a long list of about 26 topics, which are among the most material topics according to stakeholders and according to our own uh, perspective. And actually, it's interesting to see that the internal feedback and the external feedback was more or less exactly aligned. And then for each of those 26 topics, we did a, together with some uh, some external help, a sort of a desktop analysis at looking at, you know, where is the impact in, is it in our company? Is it in supply chain? Is it with the consumer? So we looked at where can we make the biggest uh, impact basically. So we haven't gone as far uh, as trying to uh, measure the impact uh, in a monetary terms for each of the topics, but we did go through a formal analysis to say, you know, where do we have the biggest impacts on the SDGs? And where can we as a company make the biggest uh, difference? And, and we published that. And of course, uh, you know, we had more than 800 stakeholders providing feedback on, uh, on our materiality as we went along. And I think this is one of the most important things for all companies to do, because 
I think the you know companies have limited resources and you need to focus on the few topics where you can make the biggest impact and difference. Otherwise, you're just greenwashing. You may be, you know, we can be the greenest company on the planet, as I said before. If you don't phase out cigarettes, you can't be, be sustainable as a tobacco company. Can I ask you a somewhat provocative question? So, um, you know, with SDGs, you know, unlike the Millennium Development Goals, which are very limited in number and very, very hard in, in terms of, of their goals, right? They're sort of numerical goals. Um, sure. The SDGs are many, many, it's 165, I can't remember. It's, it's, it's an outrageously large number. Um, and it might be interpreted as basically a menu from which companies can pluck a few that they're already making progress on um, and then say, yes, we're going to focus on those because that by basically doesn't require us to do anything. Um, how do you avoid accusations of that sort of cynicism? Uh, by involving stakeholders in determining your materiality. I think it's, you cannot just indeed, as you say, look at what you're already doing and where, where can we score the points. You need, you need to really look at, you know, where do people say you have the biggest negative uh, impacts on society or where can you make the biggest positive impacts? And as I said before, you know, uh, smoking is extremely harmful. Half of our consumers uh, uh, will, you know, likely develop, uh, let's say, uh, illnesses as a result of using our products. You know, how can it be more material than that? So this is what we need to focus on. And then you look at um, what is the agenda of the world, which is reducing or eliminating cigarettes, and how can you help to do that better? And we think our role in this, this context is replacing cigarettes with better alternatives. Right. Thanks a lot. Uh, Thomas, I'd like to move on to you and, and again ask you, um, sort of to, from your perspective as an investor, um, on the sort of attention uh, whether attention has indeed shifted from the from the E to the S um, am, among the investor class in the past six months, and uh, uh, and if you're seeing that as, as something which is which is going to persist, or whether you know you expect it to to maybe move back to E when um, when the pandemic is behind us. Thank you very much, and and good morning. I'm tempted to give you a, a sort of a quick answer, um, which is, uh, and forgive me for that, uh, why don't we start with Rachel? The S is important. We needed <laughs> equity and gender e equality, and we are three white male and one lady, and I'd like to have maybe Rachel first, if you don't mind, and I'd be very happy to answer <laughs> your question right after. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> I, I, I was leaving the best for last, but I mean, we can... We can um... <laughs> That's another way to think about it, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, well, I mean, it, it, I, you, you put me on the spot, so I will, I will, now, I will now go to, to Rachel in that case. Um, uh, Rachel, I, I, again, I, will, I would ask you a, a question about, you know, sort of following on that same broad theme about the E versus the S. Um, so, you know, CBRE... Uh, big developer, um, lots of corporate clients um, making you know, spaces for, for people to work. Now, obviously, work is changing. Work is definitely part of the S equation um, in uh, the S part of the equation in ESG. Um, has, have you seen from, your, from what your, uh, your customers are demanding or, or you know, the way that they're changing their thinking? Have you seen a shift away from a concern with the environmental footprint towards a concern with, you know, for instance, a long term just health, literal health, physical health of um, of workers? And how is how is is a healthier office going to be a uh, a necessarily more carbon intensive one? Is there a trade off there um, that you're seeing? There is, I suppose, a little bit of a trade-off. I think over the past 30 or 20 years, um, the property sector has got a lot better at, um, they started with environmental sustainability. They've got a lot better at um, developing and designing um, low energy buildings or even carbon neutral buildings. And there's a lot of focus on how, how those building systems are designed and made to be energy efficient. And then you've got renewables on top of that as well. I don't think um, social and wellness is instead of, it's as well as. Um, um, property developers are now starting to look at wellness within office spaces and workplaces. They've been looking at that for maybe the past five or so years. And I think there's an even bigger focus on it now with, with COVID and how that might impact workers. 
But I think um, we don't just look at um, commercial office space. I think there's a bigger question around social sustainability for workplaces and homes. I think with, um, with COVID, as we've seen people working from home more, we're starting to sort of question are those houses and homes suitable for working from home as well. So I think there's a sort of, um, yeah, yeah, we're looking at both, I think energy efficiency and, sustain and environmental sustainability is something that property has been working on for a, a while. And social sustainability and wellness is now as well as on top of that. So it's interesting, I, I would like to follow up on that a little bit because it's, you know, I've been working from home for the past six months. Um, and uh, it, I would have thought, for instance, that, you know, that was obviously the summer months. And, it, you know, in Britain, it's never, mm. I mean, it was pretty hot this summer, but it's not typically hot enough to warrant having an air conditioner. So in some places, you yeah. know, I was actually probably using much less energy than I would be, uh, you know, per person uh, going to the office. In many places, uh, the fact that people are working from home might actually mean that the energy efficiencies that you have in a in a you know well insulated energy efficient office are going to be lost. Um, so the wellness, in other words, you know many people like working from home. Not everyone, but you know many people do like working from home. Office workers, obviously. I mean those in the fortunate uh, professions who are able to work from home. Um, uh, so the, the, there is again there is, does seem to be a bit of a trade off. And are you seeing uh, customers and uh, and and homeowners? thinking about it in those terms uh, and and what are you telling them? Um, I mean, obviously, what, one thing you could say is that, for instance, the fact that many people are working from home, even if they're using a little bit more energy at home, they're not commuting to work. So the transport footprint is low, is, is, is a bit lower than it would otherwise have been. On the other hand, yeah. you know, in our office in London at the moment, we have, a, you know, maybe a dozen or a few dozen people coming in, whereas normally it would be 200. So the footprint per person in that office has massively shot up. So, you know, do, do you have sort of any any specific answers to, to those questions? <laughs> I don't, well, I know that we certainly haven't, and I'm not sure if anyone's looked at yet. That I guess the sort of overall carbon balance of people moving from offices to working from home. I know that across the office sector and the residential sector, there's um, encouragement from government, from the EU and the Irish government to make both of those more energy efficient. And I think, um, the commute in between, I've heard anecdotally in the office that um, some of the Dublin bike sellers have sold out of bikes and it's actually really hard to get, get hold of a bicycle at the moment. So there's a huge increase in people cycling to work when they can, I think, to avoid public transport. So I think, um, I guess the thing about homes is people tend to stay in them for sort of seven to ten years. You've got, they've kind of got what they've got. Um, so I know the Irish government and even some of the Irish banks are helping people um, finance and make their, their existing homes more energy efficient. So hopefully through the Irish winter, we can get people to be more comfortable and more um, use less carbon if they are working from home more. But I think what we've been seeing is not a complete move to working from home, but people using a bit of both. So I think for long term sustainability, we, we need to look at the energy efficiency of workplaces and, and ho housing. So, and the one last follow-up question on that is, um, obviously, you know, investments in, in energy efficiency are investments and they, they, they shouldn't be seen as a cost. They should really be seen as an investment. Mm. There is a return on it. Um, but at the moment, a lot of companies are a bit strapped for cash. Um, and a lot of homeowners, too, are strapped for cash. Yeah. Uh, so is this, is this the time to really... Are you seeing an increase in, in these sort of investments or, or a decrease in these sort of investments in the in the past six months and, and maybe sort of looking forward for the next few months? Um, are you seeing a trend? Are people using this as an opportunity to invest uh, or are you seeing uh, people hoard cash for the, well, I mean, we're in the middle of a thunderstorm, so I wouldn't say for a rainy day, <laughs> um, but, you know, just, just a, a saving for, for things which appear to be bigger priorities at the moment. Um, in terms of the commercial sector, there definitely is a huge interest in energy efficiency and developing and upgrading existing buildings to be more energy efficient. There's just a business case for that. Um, investors are looking for it. Occupants are looking for it. So that's kind of um, still, still a sort of as it was before COVID. I think with individual householders, that's more complicated. It depends on their individual situation. But I, um, I've got a background. Um, I worked in Australia for a while. I think um, compared to that in Ireland, there's 
energy efficiency makes homes more comfortable as well. So I think there's an added incentive for energy efficiency in homes in Ireland compared to Australia. But um, I think, I don't know if you can sort of draw trends on individual householders at the moment, it's a bit too, too soon to tell. But there's definitely government and um, financial support for it. Right, well, back to white males. Thomas, um, uh, <laughs> uh, can, I, can I just uh, sort of ask the question that I did before? In other words, from your vantage point as, a, as an investor, are you seeing a shift um, away from E and towards S in, in ESG considerations? Uh, we've seen definitely an increase um, in focus around S. Historically, S was a, a little difficult to grab and a lot of the attention was on E, as you said, Davos and all the sort of climate research were really fueling uh, the focus on the capabilities. And S became definitely a key determinant during the COVID crisis to the point that we published research when we looked at the performance of various portfolios to see what drove the performance during the COVID research of uh, the COVID correction of some ESG oriented portfolios. And to our surprise, uh, it was a lot connected to S. And mm. as we dug into it, uh, we found out that it was related to employment practices, relationships with clients. So how do you keep your revenue flowing during a crisis within a sector, comparing those which perform well versus those which did not perform well from a stock price standpoint? It became clear that those who were having better relationships with suppliers and clients and also had better uh, sort of um, uh, employment rules and, and approaches in terms of not laying off all their workforce because um, the, 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 uh, the environment was difficult, we found that these companies outperformed. So a more loyal workforce, more loyal customers, and it, it connects to the context, uh, the, the concept of um, license to operate, right? The, the brand and the, the perception of your company by a community at, at large. So. That was not something we were expecting to see so quickly. That was not something we were actually looking for. It just came to us through our research, which we published. So definitely, how, how, S can, can came I just, out. Stop you for a sec. Can I just, just I want sure. to follow up on, on that. Um, how do you control for the fact that, you know, companies which happen to be doing rather well out of the pandemic can afford to have, to maintain better, you know, uh, better, a better rapport with their, with their customers, with their suppliers, and and treat their workers better right you know companies which who's, who which have seen their business balloon like you know online commerce for instance um you can you know they they basically they could afford to be good to their workers um to keep them on they needed them uh you know they needed more of them often uh they could afford to keep paying their suppliers uh, how do you disentangle that um, you know, how do you control for that eventuality? That it's not that it isn't that companies were returned more money to investors because they were socially minded, but they were socially uh, minded because they could afford to return money to investors. No, I understand your point. I think the main um, technical way we control for this is by doing this analysis on a sector by sector basis. So within a sector, so if you take the, the tech companies and, and the Zooms and all the rest, yes, you compare them within themselves and you compare, let's say, utilities or transportation companies like airlines, et cetera, which really suffered within themselves. So that's the, the technical approach to how we do this research to come to our conclusions. Because a lot of people were skeptical saying, not only on the S, but on other dimensions saying, yes, you, you claim uh, ESG portfolios perform better and actually were a bit more resilient, protective during the crisis. But of course, if you didn't invest in in, in uh, oil or energy in the first place because you kind of discarded that uh, partially out of your portfolio, of course, you're going to do better. But that wasn't the case. Most uh, of the ESG portfolios are actually sector neutral and it was controlled for this sort of distortion. So that, that is a, a very important, easy criticism, but also very easy to men to analyze in the in the research so that's the first element and i think the second element around the s is there's been a surge as you as we all know in in government funding central bank intervening and so that is a reflection in a way of 
solidarity. You can be cynical and also look at, okay, it's to protect the economy as a whole. But at the end of the day, it's to protect jobs, making sure people can have a livelihood. And that, that to us is changing, massively changing asset valuations as investors. So the S is becoming important also through the interest rate policies that we see across the world. That being said, so these two factors are important as, as dimensions. That being said, uh, it's pretty clear to us that the E remains the number one focus mm -hmm. of investors and of policymakers, of regulations, and even of society at large, right? If you see demonstrations, yes, we see some are against masks in, in some, some big cities, but we're, the, most of the demonstrations are around uh, the climate. So I think it's a delicate balance. And at the moment, what we see as two big themes for investors is on one hand, and a lot for institutional investors, mainly climate orientation, thinking much more uh, in a, rigorously about 2050 net zero being 1.5 degrees uh, above uh, pre-industrial levels. That is attracting a ton of research, a ton of design for portfolios to actually be able to connect uh, 2050 pathways to portfolios on one, one hand. And the other side is sustainable development goals, as you were mentioning earlier. Uh, that seems to become a language for um, private investors in particular to really understand what they are putting their money to. And even though the sustainable development goals were designed for country level objectives, so very hard to connect to a portfolio, uh, the 169 targets that are underlying them uh, are targets that can be connected to ESG metrics. And that's the kind of research we're doing to really progressively analyze portfolios in light of this. And the important question you raised earlier is, you can't just pick and choose. You cannot say, I'm supporting SDG number five, whilst at the same time, you're harming SDG number eight. So it's really about a net effect. It's about the concept that the EU uh, is developing of do no harm that are progressively getting embedded in our portfolio designs. So, I, and I think the SDGs is in a way, the Lehman's way of talking about uh, the S in ESG, a lot of it. So can, can I ask, so, you know, ESG, one, of the, one of the problems, one of the sort of criticisms or, or um, maybe it's not a criticism, but sort of one of the challenges for, for ESG investing is, is coming up with the right stand, accounting standard and metrics. Um, there, there's a proliferation of accounting standards and metrics for ESG. Um, you know, some of them lead to somewhat sort of counterintuitive um, uh, results such as, you know, something, a, a, an oil and gas company being, being, uh, uh, scoring pretty high because it's moving away from, uh, from coal to, to oil or to, from coal to gas, still a brown, if not a, an entirely dirty fuel. Um, uh, mm. but there is a proliferation of standards. Is, do you see investors coalescing? around this, a, a, a certain set of standards or, or maybe just a, a handful of sets of standards that are becoming, you know, best practice? Um, and, and if not, when, when do you expect that to happen? Um, very, very important point related to all the data behind ESG and how it's used and the quality of it and the analytics behind them. So I'd say two, two parts to your question. One is about really the standards like SASB, TCFD, GRI, these are organizations that are putting in place and proposing ways for companies to disclose. On the other hand, I think you referred to a scoring systems where maybe an energy company would score high and a, a, more, a, a greener business would score not as high. These are more uh, data providers like the index providers or a, a number, there's a flurry, as you say, of ESG data providers and impact data providers. So there are uh, parts of answers for both. So first for the um, accounting standards, the proper one, what is very uh, difficult to manage for the world is when there's fragmentation, different points of views of how we should report. We've seen over the years, the accounting standards, not the sustainable ones, but the traditional ones have progressively, progressively uh, converged to a, an international standard. Um, in still various parts uniform. of the world, still not uniform, but at least manageable for companies to report yeah. and then make some equivalents. Um, 
the same is expected uh, for sustainability standards, but we're at the start of the journey. So everyone's kind of innovating in their own part of the world. What's very encouraging is the recent in June uh, combination of all these uh, organizations to aim for something that's combined, right? So where companies will be able to uh, not have to choose between one standard or the other or have to report on all these standards. So that's very encouraging to us uh, that the, the sort of rivalry, for example, between GRI and uh, TCFD uh, and SASB, sorry, came to an end. Both organizations talk to each other and are now working together. This is fantastic. I think this is what we support. Um, there's also a, a global tension between uh, more Anglo-Saxon and European standards coming together. Again, they're talking to each other. That's, that's necessary. We find already that using these standards is extremely effective uh, in terms of pro pro encouraging companies to disclose. So TCFD definitely has helped. Uh, the financial industry to be able to analyze these companies because we can want and to change uh, the portfolio management in the direction of sustainability. If there's no data, we can't do much. Then when you look at scoring systems that various index providers uh, bring to us mm -hmm. and non-index providers, you're right. One uh, and uh, The criticism that's usually made is company A, well, scoring company A and company B end up with contradicting uh, messages because the, the aggregate scoring they provide don't add up, don't, I mean, contradict uh, each other. What's important for asset managers, and that's also what our clients are putting onto us, is they don't want us to just blindfully use the aggregate scores. They want us to do our own research, use the raw data, and understand why these differences exist. And we actually can justify why a provider A and provider B come to different results. It's just because they've aggregated data differently and they are showing something different. If we use the core information, and that's what we've built, and many sources of data, then uh, we can really have insights to manage portfolios. So I, I think what's important is the availability of data on climate, on social issues, so and at, at raw level, so that asset managers can use them at raw level and then do their own analytics. Uh, thank you. Um, Aris, I, I wanted to ask you sort of just from your perch as, as an academic observing this world, whether you're seeing something similar to Thomas. In other words, that there is this, there is some form of a convergence on the standards, but still uh, a little bit more of a way to go on the on the specific uh, indexes and uh, and metrics. Uh, and, you know, how, how you see the prospects for having something relatively uniform for for most people to agree on in the way that we have you know the GAP uh, accounting standards for finances thank you so I am um, you know let I um, I, I want to reframe the question a little bit and, and to say that um, uh, Thomas has made a very clear case and, and the announcement this month or last month about all the different providers CDP and SASP and, and GRI and so on coming together that's a, a great step in the right direction but I, um, I think in a way we're a little bit past that conversation. Not that it isn't important, but it's a mechanism. I guess that the, the reality of things, I, I cannot see a rationale where a company, and I'm not talking about from uh, an investor perspective here, but from a business perspective, I, I cannot see any sort of reason why a, a company that is invested in the future has a long-term view of what it wants to create, how it creates value, can afford to ignore the env environmental, social, and governance considerations. All the evidence around us at the moment, whether environmental, the impact of climate change, the gradation of natural ecosystems, the growing polarization and, 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 and side effects of, of, of inequality, you know, they, they create very real commercial, financial, economic, reputational, ideological, personal, generational. There's, there's a million business cases that a company can can make. So I I we see many organizations, particularly this year, but over the last kind of decade or so, that have set very ambitious policies, um, net positive to 2030 to 2040. Um, and we've had a flurry of, of, of those companies from every single sector, technology, retail, we've had you know the, the Unilevers have been followed by the Danones, the IKEAs. Google and Microsoft and many, many examples who have not been hampered 
by the lack of convergence of those standards that have gone ahead and put some very, very ambitious goals. Um, so I, I would not, you know, I, I cannot take the lack of convergence of standardization that we're not there yet as any reason why companies could not and should not take ambitious action to address not just their own footprint, but their change in role in society and what is expected of them. It's no longer enough for an organization to say, you know, we emit, we'll try to minimize our footprint. You know, who cares if you try to minimize your footprint only? What COVID has shown us is how connected we are and how interdependent we are. So everybody, all those, all those forward-looking organizations, if we want to, if they want to have a play a role in this new sustainable economy, then they have to start looking at how do they create solutions for for problems that we experience uh, as society as a whole to retain that license to operate. And the other sort of from an academic point of view, um, counterpoint is. Whilst we often talk about the lack of clear evidence about the causality between returns and sustainability, I don't think I've ever seen any evidence that says a company that has invested in sustainability has not done well financially. I haven't seen anything that says, you know, we, we are investing, we are taking action, we are investing, we're becoming a better company, managing our our business and our risk well, and suddenly, you know, our, our markets are abandoning us. So, well, uh, BP is really one example. Um, just after BP announced its very ambitious uh, environmental plans, its share price collapsed. I think it's lowest it has been in a couple of decades. Thomas can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it does seem that you know, it, you know, it's not it's not always necessarily a one way bet. Which isn't to say that BP is doing the wrong thing. On the contrary, um, I, you know, it could well be doing a in the long run. It could be doing the absolutely the right thing. I think becoming a new type of energy major. Is is uh, is a long term bet that could way pay off. Pay off. It clearly didn't pay off in the short term. Yes, and if we if we um, if we look at the short term, then I don't know. You know, an announcement is very different to performance, and I'm I'm referring to performance. If somebody says we're going to do this and we're going to do that, and and markets react in a specific way that's fine but i i know of no company that has invested seriously in sustainability and has made its business model the way it creates value and how it distributes it to the various stakeholders more inclusive more circular more um uh, net zero carbon more nature positive and has come back after a couple of years later and said you know sorry no we 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 uh it didn't work you know, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm very open to, to suggestions and evidence that kind of shows that. But I think the, the, the bigger point that I want to make is that there's dozens, now hundreds of companies that are committing, putting some very ambitious plans forward for sustainability, whether that's uh, climate, uh, nature, and we've seen a lot of action on business and nature recently, or increasingly in, 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 in equality. Um, and, and economic inequality, which is becoming better understood, but still we have a long way to go to make the link between the, the, the business role in, in inequality. And, and, and we do a lot of work in CSL on that. But I, I think there is um, there's good things that need to happen. Convergence of standards and metrics is, is definitely one of them, but that should not hamper ambitious business action at all at this stage where we are. So, so let me finish with, with a quick question. We only have about a minute and a half to go to Rachel and Hoop uh, about ambitious business action. So um, Aris mentioned, you know, a million business cases. Could you give each of you, could you give me a 30 second, your number one business case for your company specifically, for CBRE and for uh, Philip Morris International um, of, uh, uh, of sustainability? What's the, you know, what's the, maybe not the lowest hanging fruit, but what's the best business case for you uh, Rachel, and for you, Hook. Rachel, let's start with you. I think one of the sort of biggest, also the most exciting trends I've seen in the property sector in the past couple of years is I think um, different companies are really starting to collaborate. And I think the World Green Building Councils and the different country Green Building Councils have really helped pull companies together, is that they are setting ambitious targets to be carbon neutral by 2030 or 2040. 
And it's working really well as an industry because it's helping build capacity within those industries, um, setting up the supply chains to deliver those solutions. And rather than competing and trying to do one up, there's been a real sense of collaboration and moving together as an industry rather than trying to compete with each other. And I think that's been really successful and helped um, sort of smaller companies sort of be pulled up by the larger ones. I think that's been um, a really big success and I hope to see sort of more examples of that in the future, maybe around social sustainability or, or other issues. So, so industry coordination, uh, certainly a, yeah. a, a, one, one good way forward. And Hope, from you? Well, I think our business case uh, lies all on the smoke-free vision. I mean, 1.1 billion people smoke cigarettes today, uh, extremely harmful. We have a better alternative for our companies as well. We think in 10 to 15 years, the world can be without cigarettes. And that's not just good for, for people, it's also good for business ultimately because the new products are also profitable. We are ahead of the competition and gaining market share. And honestly, I think if we would just have a slogan and no metrics to follow how we are moving, people would not trust us. And also they wouldn't trust us unless it would make business sense, and it does. So I think you know, improving your products uh, for the health of the consumers in our case, that's a very strong business case. Otherwise, stakeholders and shareholders and the board would never approve it. Well, wonderful. That's a very positive note in a way to, to end on. Um, I'd like to thank each, each uh, and every one of you. It was a very interesting um, conversation. I, I hope that uh, everyone listening found it uh, enlightening as well. Um, I uh, thank the panel. And normally, we would have a, a huge round of applause um, we can possibly hear it virtually now in, a, in our heads. I'm sure the panel deserve it. And I would like to invite all of you uh, viewers and listeners to stay tuned for my interview with Kevin Sneeder, who is the managing partner of McKinsey and Company, who, uh, which is coming up after a virtual coffee break. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. <laughs>